Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, you know, last week or maybe the week before, if you were still in school, if you were a kid, a teen, a young adult, you might have received a report card. Maybe some of you parents, you saw your kids come home with that report card. It's been a lot of years since I've got a report card from a school. Um, yeah, it's enough that you have to think about the number of years, so it's been a lot of years since I got that report card. But I do remember when I was in school, there were two types of kids when it was report card time. There were those that were really excited, and there were those that were very nervous, right? So you're all thinking right now, oh, I was that one or I was the other. Actually, after first service, I had lots of people coming to me telling me which camp they went in. Now, usually the people that were excited was because they got really great marks. And maybe they were excited because now they got to brag to their friends or their siblings. Or maybe it was just the joy of achievement. Or, or perhaps they'd been meddling in the 70s in math and they're pretty sure this is the semester they got to 80. Which is exciting, right? And even for some, I know I had friends that they would be, if they got a certain mark, if they got all A's or all A's and B's, the family was going to Canada's Wonderland, right? There were some of those things, so they'd be excited. But then... They're the people that were nervous at report card time. And I spoke to someone after first service, and they said, when they got the report card, it was like, oh, did I pass? Did I pass? Did I pass? Okay, I passed. 51. Awesome. But we would get, there were people that would get so nervous. Did I pass? Am I going to be accepted? Are my parents going to be disappointed? Are they going to be angry? Is this my grade three report card? Is this going to be where my career ceiling is set at, like, inchworm harvester or something for fishermen around the world. And we worry about this. Now, most of the time that I was in school, I was in Camp A. I was usually excited to see um, my report cards. I was usually between 75 and 85 percent in most of my classes. Honestly, history I found fascinating, so I did okay in that. I really enjoyed math. Science was okay. If I was ever going to get a 90, it was probably in phys ed. There were some of those things that I liked. French was not one of them. French, it just did not click in my head, and it still doesn't totally click in my head. In grade six, I'm in a grade six, seven split, and we have this pretty new teacher to our school. His name is Monsieur Grolot. You can tell by how I say Monsieur how good I am at French, right? I didn't retain very much, obviously. But this guy was awesome. He was like a really fun guy. No mushrooms jokes, Jace. But he was a really fun guy. He was just that character. He would tell those cheesy jokes that if your dad told them, you're like, that's so lame. But your teacher told them, so you're like, wow, that's an awesome joke. And he coached our volleyball team, which was awesome because he didn't teach us to, to attack or to spike or nice terms like that. He would encourage us to smash the ball in their face. That's what he would tell us to do. So we really liked this guy. But he was a hard marker. And I don't know exactly how people pick curriculum here and there. I don't know exactly how that works, but I'm sure he went way past what was needed. In fact, I remember our class, once we got to St. Pete's, we would do grade nine French, and it was like a grade seven review. Like, we were so far ahead of where the other kids were. But the path to that was challenging. In grade six, I had this project. I had to do a six-page French newspaper. I left it to the very last minute, I underestimated how bad I was at French and also how well I was prepared for this. I stayed up as a grade six till four in the morning. These marks meant something to me. This is one of the only times I stayed up, and that was in grade six, which is weird. But 4 a.m., I go into class, not proud of my work, knowing I am handing in a steaming pile of garbage to this teacher. And I'm just like, oh, all that time, all wasted. I kind of left it to a hope and a prayer. I was just like, God, I don't even know what else to do. And honestly, I started thinking about it. I was like, you know what, maybe it'll work out. Because usually it did. You always had those tests or those projects you weren't so confident in. And yeah, you're not going to get 85 in those, but you still get like 67 or 71 or something like that. I thought maybe that is what would happen. Spoiler alert, that is not what happened. So the teacher goes back a couple weeks later. He has marked these French projects. 
And again, the guy was a bit eccentric. He would slam them down on your desk, and we're in pods of four desks, and he would just slam them down, mark side up, and I'm get, so you're seeing the marks of everyone. And I saw my friend who was way smarter than me. I actually found out very recently, this is Christie's cousin, I believe. He's a really smart guy, and I saw his, and he got 103%. 103, I'm like, come on. But then there was a part of me, it was like, ooh, maybe he actually knew this was really hard, so he graded us, graded us a bit easier. That was not the case. He plopped mine down, and I'd seen A's before. I'd seen lots of B's, the odd C. I hadn't really seen a ton of D's on my work before, and there was none of those. The only place I'd ever seen an F before was on TV or a cartoon or something like that, and I didn't even see that. I saw a big E. Who knew? It didn't mean excellent. I can assure you of that. And underneath that, it was 47 out of 100. Do better next time. Do better next time. As an achiever, <laughs> this gutted me. I got way too much of my self-worth when I was younger from my marks. But you know what? That never happened again. Monster Grow Low, through that project, gave me a gift that has served me well throughout the rest of my life. I got feedback from someone I trusted and had the opportunity to make adjustments and to change and to get better. And I remember the next year, the French project was on a country. It was on Switzerland. And I remember that one too. I got 90 on that one. So I learned something, but I had to make some adjustments. I had to not only adjust how much time I give these types of projects, but I had to adjust my attitude towards French, which I didn't like. And I knew I just had to adjust it to the end of grade nine because I was never taking it again. But it gave me that opportunity to do that. The tension I want to talk about this morning for you and for myself is this. How do we ensure we keep growing after we stop getting report cards? How do we ensure we're still growing when we stop getting report cards? When a teacher stops checking up on us week after week, month after month, semester after semester, who is it we're supposed to check in with? How do we get a progress report? And, and we all know, especially those of us that school is a bit of a distant memory, we know that really growth really starts after school, it feels like. There's so many areas that we need to and we do grow in, so certainly the answer is not to grow anymore. But there's going to be report cards that you see. I have an example of a report card here uh, for normal subjects, math, English, science, French. I was kind to myself, gave myself a D minus there. Um, but we, we have these marks in school, but what if we had a report card that looked like this? Dealing with our finances, our relationships, our walk with God, our rhythms in life. What if we did that? And that's what I want to talk a bit about um, this morning. How important it is to reflect ourselves so we actually find some of this out to be able to ask people that are around us to give us honest feedback, the most sure grow lows of our life, but then, of course, to go to God with this as well, which is where we're going to uh, be spending a little bit of time right now. Now, I want to read through a chapter in the book of Psalms. It is chapter 139 in the book of Psalms. Now, this, a lot of Psalms was written by King David. Yes, that's the same David, like David and Goliath, same guy, and he's king, and this is around 1,000 B.C., that he lived his life. And, and honestly, there's lots in the Old Testament about theology and about covenants and about history and about all of these types of things. We hear lots about Israel. We hear lots about this nation and that nation. But Psalms is really interesting because it actually reads a lot more like a journal entry. And if you've ever read it, you see that. This is an imperfect man that is communicating, that is praying to God. And sometimes it's really high, sometimes it's really low, but it's very, very honest. Later in Scripture, uh, it is said that David it was a man after God's own heart. And I find this so valuable, just like the feedback from my teacher years ago. This is so valuable for us to get a sneak peek of um, David's communication with God. So um, I want to read through... Um, the chapter of uh, Psalm 139. I'm not going to do the entire thing. I'm going to do a decent amount. Please pay attention. I'm going to be doing a lot of verses at the very beginning. Um, but really, that lays out the context for uh, the prayer at the end. So we're going to start right now, Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. 
You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. So if I were to summarize these first six verses, it would be not only does God know everything, God does know everything, but God knows me. It's personal. Everything with David is really, really personal. Not only does God know everything, but God knows me. The next six verses, starting in verse 7. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. And as I read through those verses, and again, many of you have read this chapter before, but again, if we try and simplify it, what he's saying here is God is with me. God is with me. Not just God is everywhere, but God is with me. And you know, if you're, maybe you are a person of faith here, maybe you're not. Both those camps can have feelings throughout life that God is really far away, but David assures us that God is with me, which brings me to the next five verses I wanted to read. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, and I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. And I would summarize this one with God created me. God created everything, but God created me. You know, before I, I worked at um, before I worked at Pathway, I worked at Telus for 15 years, and I worked on data networks and business phone systems, that type of thing. And there was a lot of projects I was involved in, but probably the biggest was our local hospital. When it was new, I think in and around 2008, I spent months and months, close to a year before that, when before nurses or doctors or patients or even room numbers or doors were in there, I was wandering those halls. I was making sure wires were going where they needed to go. I would go from a patient room to a connection box full of wires and connectors, knew where all the communication rooms were, one on every ward, and how they would all feed to the main center where there was uh, the servers and firewalls and all of that equipment, all of that stuff that makes it work. I spent months there. It's all I did. I knew those rooms so, so well. I knew the cables that were in the walls, in the floors, in the ceilings. I really had a very complete knowledge of how that thing worked. And that helped me service it for a lot of years after that. But as I think about it, that knowledge I have of that technical thing is just a blip. Not even like the head of a needle about how well God knows us. So you can know somebody, but if you created something, you know it so well. You know it inside and you know it out. So to summarize those first 17 verses, God doesn't just know everything. He knows me. He is not just everywhere. He is with me. He didn't just create everything. He created me. Now in the next five verses, David switches the tone a little bit, and he's very much talking about a holy God who demands justice, which is very true. And he talks about sin, and David talks about his part in this, in the judgment of sin. But then it leads into, after David has all of these words that are actually quite strong, it leads into this prayer in verses 23 and 24. And this is where we're going to land and spend so much time this morning. This is a courageous prayer that has become a progress report to me. And I'll just read these verses now. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the paths of everlasting life. You know, I've heard that verse for years. I've, I've known it a decent amount throughout the years, but it's actually been as part of a mentor group that I've been part of this year that I've really been digging into it, which I'll get into in just a little bit. But this is a prayer that we can pray to a God that loves us, that knows us, that created us, and who is with us. And I want to go through each line um, of that prayer, of those verses, one by one. So I'm going to start with the first part, which is this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. David is asking God to search him, to go to the places that self-reflection alone cannot go. He knew that God loved him. He knew he could trust God. But he knew he had to invite God into the process if he was ever going to find out what his true motives were, what his heart was. See, personal reflection is good. Um, and I think we have a slide for this. Personal reflection is good, but incomplete without God. It is. And personal reflection is good. Anybody can have personal reflection, but without God, it is simply incomplete. We need more than that. You know, in 2005, which in my head when I first say, I'm like, that wasn't that long ago. That was a long time ago. Uh, 2005, I think we only had one child, we have four now, um, and they're almost all teenagers. So that's, okay, so it was a while ago, uh, Carolyn and I bought this house. And we were really excited to buy this house, because we both grew up in rural areas, and uh, we were just really excited to do this. Now, of course, we didn't have to worry about any of the, maybe, stuff that doesn't go as well in rural areas. Our parents worried about that, we just enjoyed the benefits of it. Well, we moved in in November, and uh, the entire yard was covered in leaves. And the day we were moving, uh, some of you were there actually helping us move, uh, the snow started, and the snow stayed all winter. And we started no noticing we were having some plumbing issues, which was concerning. And then as spring started coming and the snow starts melting, we noticed there was one particular area of our yard that was melting extremely fast. It almost seemed like it was bubbling up. Not a good thing if you live in the country. We all also noticed when we would come at our front door that there was this really terrible smell. And it was too early for the farmers to be doing their things. We we're like, what is going on? So what I did is I asked some people I trusted, my dad, some friends, my neighbor. It's like, what's going on? And I think they knew right away what was going on, but they're like, oh, maybe it could be a smaller thing, but what was happening was our septic system was failing at our house. We had just bought this house. We had maybe even bought a few extra things, so money was a little tight, and all of a sudden we're hearing this septic business. And as I started looking into it, I'm like, this is not fun. I do not want to be going here. But we had a next step that we had to do. We had to dig. We had to dig. We had to dig to see what the problem was, how extensive it was. Is it a partial replacement, a full replacement? What is it? And just like this verse, search me, O God, and know my heart, it's an invitation to dig. It requires trust, but it's an invitation to dig. In our lives, I think we all have those areas that maybe don't smell quite right, and we know that. This is an invitation to dig. And I want to ask a question of all of us, myself and you as well, is am I willing to search my own heart, step one, but am I willing to ask God to do the same? Can I trust God enough to invite him into that process? It brings us to the second line, which is this. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. David knew that anxious thoughts or fear that was just evidence of areas where he didn't fully trust God. He didn't fully trust God because fear and anxiety, it will strangle the life out of you. It'll strangle progress and growth. Now, honestly, nothing paralyzes you quite like fear. And I don't know if any of you have been there before where it's like something you do that's really scary. Maybe it's an amusement park or maybe it's something in life and you just freeze. You're like, I can't go anywhere. That's the same idea, and we have this happen in our life all the time. It might be the fear of speaking out. It might be the fear of leaning in. It might be the fear of starting some new venture that is exactly what God has created you to do, but you're afraid because there's a chance of failure. Or maybe it is a fear or anxiety to love deeply once again after you've been hurt. 
Back to the septic example, we had lots of fears and anxiety the more we were finding out about this. We knew that this could be not very good. It was very tempting just to freeze and do nothing. Maybe it'll just fix itself. That does not happen. (laughs) That does not happen. It would have just led to bigger issues. You know what? It led us to a place where we recognized what needed to be replaced, and at the end of the day, it fixed the issue, and it was exactly what we needed, which leads to this question here, which is, what are the areas of my life that I'm holding back because I'm anxious or fearful? And if we honestly, again, this whole process is us praying to God, working this through, using it as a progress report. What are the areas of my life that I'm holding back because I'm too anxious or fearful? And I think we all have these areas, all have these areas to work on. This brings me to the next line. Point out anything in me that offends you. The biblical word for this is sin. If you've been in church, you've heard it. Maybe if you haven't been in church, you've heard this before. See, this is where digging gets really hard, doesn't it? It's one thing. How many people think it's fun to ask the people that live in your home or really close friends to ask them, hey, is there anything about me that offends you? It just really annoys me? That's a dangerous question. You might get some answers. Sorry, you will get some answers you're not going to like. But imagine inviting God into the process. Point in anything that offends you, God. But when we open up ourselves to this question, we have the opportunity to fix something before it stinks like a malfunctioning septic system. You might find out some stuff about yourself that people don't, they don't like and you didn't know. Maybe people find you overbearing. Maybe they find you angry and don't want to be around you. Maybe they find you really selfish or lazy. Those ones sting, right? But as we search ourselves and search God, we'll find some of those things. We'll find those things that are ugly and embarrassing and unwanted for sure. But it's at this point that we have the choice. Are we going to keep going? Are we going to pray this courageous prayer and actual action on it? Or the other option is to just try and bury the problem. Like, ooh, that's ugly. Dirt back on, dirt back on. Like, that was like the temptation because I was so naive with this whole septic thing we had it. I'm like, can we just pile a big mound of dirt over it? Then we won't see the bubbling problem fixed. That is not problem fixed. That is just bigger, bigger problems. But we do this in our life all the time. And uh, which leads to the next question, which is this. Do I have people in my life to invite to give me this feedback? That's important. But more important is this. Do I ever invite God? Or have I ever invited God into this process? Have I ever invited God into this process? To honestly ask him, God, is there anything that offends you in me? And quite honestly, if you've heard the word gospel, the gospel is all about this. Maybe your experience with Christianity Um, in your own life or in other people's lives is the opposite. But in fact, the gospel is all about, no, no, stop burying it. Stop trying to look perfect. It's about take it all off. Let's look at the whole thing. Let's expose it so it can be healed. Again, we can never be perfect by ourselves, but we can be made perfect through him. Which leads us to the last line, which is this. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. I found the first few times I was really reading this and memorizing this, it was easy to just read through this. Seems like kind of churchy words, but if we really look at it and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I read this quote this week. I don't have a slide for it, but it's by an ancient philosopher, and it says this. If you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. It's kind of funny, because you read it, you're like, well, obviously. That just makes sense. Honestly, when I read that, I'm like, okay, is that actually from Yoda? Is it from Kung Fu Panda? That's what it seems like. It's like, if you do not change your direction, you may end up where you're heading. Well, obviously. But in life, how many times is it not so obvious for us? But what God is inviting us here is to lead, that we would follow his lead in his ways. That we would, we read through scripture and Proverbs And in Jeremiah and so many other places in the New Testament that we need to lean on his understanding, not our own. On his thoughts, not our own. We need to lean on God and not just us. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, after he died on the cross and he was resurrected, he left us the Holy Spirit to be with us. 
Is the Holy Spirit powerful? Yes. Is he our comforter? Yes. He is also our guide. If we want to be led in these ways, we need to ask, Holy Spirit, please help me. And then finally, it's so important that we dig into the scriptures. And I know we talk about this a lot. Pastor Nathan had a whole message a few weeks ago called Fresh Bread. You didn't watch it. Please watch it. It's so, so good. But talking about just those times where we're actually going to not only get our progress report from the scriptures, but we are also going to get the answers to that progress report from the scriptures. It's so, so important. So in light of this and David writing so authentically, I thought this summer would be a great opportunity for us to go through some of these things that might be challenging us. Now, many of you might have a week off or two weeks off this summer, maybe more, or maybe just your evenings are a bit freer. But I want to encourage you to not just trust that experience will make you better, but that there's action attached to that that we need uh, to have. So summer really is the perfect time to slow down, to reflect, to create a progress report with these verses, to use them to create a progress report. So I wanted to go through four different categories really quickly, just really practical things that maybe we can look at. So the first one is this, it's finances. Finances, when we think about finances, We can reflect and find our own motives, but what if we pray to God and say, God, what are my motives when it comes to my financial picture? Is it to be seen as important? Is it to live life that I see on social media or movies that really just sends me into spiraling debt? Or is it that I truly do put all my trust or most of my trust in money and things? And and honestly, if... If as I'm reading through these, if one or more of these motives makes you kind of go, or makes you just like, why would he say that? Uh, Not saying anything, I'm just saying that might be an indication that this is an area that you or I could be struggling. That's the first part. The next is to test me and know my anxious thoughts. What, What are my anxious thoughts about finances? Am I worried that if I don't have enough, I won't measure out or measure up? Am I afraid that I'm going to miss out? Am I afraid that I'm not going to have enough? So I just work 15-hour days, seven days a week, because I'm not going to have enough. It's never enough. It's never enough. And then if we pray to God, God, point out those things in me that offend you. And we might find some ugly stuff, some words that we would never attach to ourselves, like greed, like gluttony, like pride. But then we ask God, It's not all bad, it's tough, but it's not all bad. We ask God to lead us in the path of everlasting life, a way of generosity, which will bring you so much joy, having priorities correct in your life, having prudence and wisdom so you have the extra money to help others. These are all such good things. But again, it doesn't happen unless we step through this process. Put this through the filter of those last two verses of Psalm 139. Let's do a second one here, and that's relationships. What are my motives in my relationships? Is it to get something from that other person? Or am I looking to also give? Is it to take advantage of them? Is it to control them? What what are my motives? And maybe your motives are really pure in your relationships. But this is one way that we can walk through this and ask God, test the things we fear. Do we often not enter in relationships because we're afraid we won't measure up? We won't be enough. We won't be what they expect. We won't be funny enough. We won't be smart enough. So we just stay clear. We stay away. Maybe it's past hurts that are there. Maybe you've been controlled in a friendship or relationship before and you're so afraid of that. We need to pray, God, point those things out in me. And then here we go, point out the sin or the things um, that are holding me back from you. Maybe we need to forgive in our relationships. Maybe we've been holding grudges for so long and relationships just have a shelf life because as soon as we get to a certain point, they're going to offend us just like you're going to offend them and we need to learn that we have to forgive. And then the way, um, the path of everlasting life is to love selflessly, to forgive often, to lean into those offenses and don't let them fester, to be really generous in your friendship. If you do those things, you will find yourself surrounded by good friends. Which leads me to the third one, which is our walk with God. What are our motives in our walk with God? Maybe they're really good, but maybe if we're really honest, we're like, God, I don't even really have a strong desire to spend time with you. And honestly, it's like digging up a septic. It's better to have that understanding and have that honest conversation with God than to just leave it. 
But maybe that's your starting point. Your fears or anxieties. Maybe Many of us, when coming to God, the fear or anxiety is A, that we're not good enough, or B, that he's going to see all the stuff, right? Which, uh, breaking news, he already sees it, but <laughs> that's kind of our fear as we go through a process like this, that he's going to see all our stuff. Point out something in us that offends him, that we're far from him, that we say with our mouth that he is the Lord of my life, but we actually don't live like he is the Lord of my life. And the way of everlasting life would be to spend some time with God. It's as easy as that. Like we don't have to like make a huge, we, we just take the next step in the right direction to have Christian community to, big, to dig into the scriptures. Which brings me to the last one, which is a little bit unique. And it is this, the rhythms of life. I wanted to walk through this one because it's really, really personal. This has actually been something that I have been struggling with and I have been praying this prayer in the context of the whole chapter, knowing that there is a God who knows me and loves me, created me and is with me, knowing all of that stuff. But I still, I have struggled in this area. And just like David being so authentic in the Psalms, I wanted to walk through what I've been doing through this. I've been searching my motives. Why is it? that oftentimes I find myself not having a healthy rhythm, doing too much, being too busy? Is it that I feel like in order to get to that place of comfortable rest, I have to achieve so much? Maybe sometimes for us it might be self-centeredness or achieving our dreams. Um, I, I, I think there's, there's so many areas that we're we don't want to miss anything, right? We don't want to miss anything. We want to take advantage of every opportunity. As I've been asking God to search my heart, these things are challenging me. When I ask God to test me and know my anxious thoughts in this, my anxious thoughts are that I'm not going to achieve enough. I'm not going to get enough done. Maybe even not be enough or even be perceived as being enough. These are some of the challenges for me as I put this whole idea of the rhythms of my life through this prayer in Psalm 139. Point at anything in me that offends you, God. Sometimes when these rhythms get out of whack, it's because of, of pride, it's because of selfishness. It's having priorities in the wrong sequence, which really relates back to pride and selfishness. And then the path of everlasting life. Healthy rhythms in your life are possible, but you need to make them happen and you have to get rid of some other stuff first. Having Sabbath, having time to rest and relax be with the people that you love, making the priorities, priorities, and trusting. Trusting in God, trusting in those around you. I would encourage you this summer to pick one of those. Those are just four examples of mine. There's probably 50 others. Whatever is a good fit for you is great. I want to start asking others around us, the Monsieur Gros Lows of our life. Ask those people. That's a good starting place, but I would suggest that you also ask God and have some quality one-on-one -on -one time with him. Which leads me back to the question I kind of started with. Uh, this morning is how do we ensure that we keep growing after we stop getting report cards? How do we ensure that we keep growing? I think part of it is in the self-reflection as David, again, you read through Psalms, you see that. Part of it is in the other people we can ask. But I think part of it is in this prayer. It's in the heart of this prayer. It's in the actual going through the filter of those last two verses can be an opportunity for us to do this, to get a real progress report. Like, I hope that we wouldn't be people, that we wouldn't be a church that just blindly go through life just a million miles forward. Because honestly, the stakes are too high in our life and in eternity. See, if we don't take initiative to get feedback from others, if we don't take initiative to go to God, it won't ever happen. And we won't get those progress reports. And I know report cards sound boring, but they're actually really important to track our progress so we know where we are and we know where we need to go. And if we don't do this, we're going to start seeing bigger issues coming, just like that septic system. It probably started with just not probably being maintained years and years before. But really, in our lives, that can lead to things like burnout. It can lead to relational wreckage all around our lives. It might be bankruptcy. It might be you get to that point in your life that you need someone and realize there's no one around you to go to. Maybe because we haven't been investing in relationships like we should. For some people, there's no answer to the question, what happens when I die? What happens when I pass on from this earth? And in the past couple months, I've had to go to a couple funerals of people I've known 
One was a really dear friend whose life ended way, way too early. And another is someone who lived a long life, but I'm so encouraged to know that I know exactly where they are. They're with Jesus right now. But I know there might be people that are here that don't know confidently the answer to that question. Before you dive into anything like finances or relationships or your rhythms of life, please, let's tackle that one. If you've been going through your life just trusting that a hope and a prayer will do it, if I'm just good enough, if I'm a pretty nice guy, if this or that, there's more. I would encourage you to accept Jesus' free gift of forgiveness that he offers to you, free to us, not free to him. But it also comes with an invitation to real relationship. And you might be hearing that relationship with God. What does that even mean? It's possible. God, God wants to be in relationship with you. He knows you inside and out. He is with you, but this is a bit of an active process. We have to turn to him. But maybe you have eternity figured out, and maybe most of you, all of you, some of you do. That's wonderful. I would encourage you this summer, take one or two of these areas, whether it be finances, marriage, relationships. Maybe for you, it's, it's lust that you've been battling with for a really long time. Maybe it's like me. It's the rhythms of life that you know aren't quite right. There's something we can do, though. This summer, I hope that we would, would take the time uh, to reflect ourselves. Summer's a good time to do that, you know, looking into some waves or something like that. It's a good time to reflect. Ask some people around you you trust, but please go to God. I know this has been a hard journey of me going through this the past number of months. Search my heart, oh God, that's a hard prayer to start with. But it is also so, so rewarding that we would seek God, ask him to search our heart and our motives. Ask him to identify how fear and anxiety is holding us back. How the sin in our lives is not only hurting us, but keeping us from those around us. And ask him to lead us in the path of everlasting life. And honestly, I hope for each and every one of you, some of you I know really well, some not as well, but I hope for each of you um, that you would see growth and you would see progress in your life. It won't come by just a hope and a prayer, but I hope this prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139 would be a good starting place. So I'm just going to pray, and in a second, Henry's going to come up and go through communion. This is such a great opportunity to truly talk to God. Maybe when someone prays, we're just thinking about other things and what's next and what's coming up. I, I encourage you as we pray and go through communion to take this time to connect with your Father in heaven. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this word. Thank you for David, God, and the words that, that he penned in Psalm 139, God. I pray that you would give us the courage to pray this prayer, God. That you would search our heart, God. Search my heart, oh God. Test me and know my anxious thoughts, God. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me in the path path of everlasting life. God, we pray those words and we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen.